time to move on to the next uh, talk, which is also a video uh, by Marek Beranowski, just to say. Hello, my name is Mark Beranowski. Today I am presenting our SMT theory of fixed point arithmetic. We will begin by introducing fixed point arithmetic, including where it is used and how it works. We will discuss the syntax and semantics of our theory, including the design decisions we made along the way. Finally, we will discuss the results of our performance study and an application of our work on a real world problem. Fixed point arithmetic, like floating point arithmetic, is used as an approximation of real numbers in computation. However, unlike floating point arithmetic, fixed point arithmetic can be efficiently implemented using integer operations. Many embedded programs use fixed point arithmetic due to power considerations, and many embedded processors lack a floating point unit due to cost. Recent research has shown that neural networks quantized using fixed point arithmetic can have better efficiency compared to floating point implementations while maintaining comparable answer quality. Due to these emerging use cases, we feel more efficient tools are needed to reason about programs using fixed point arithmetic. In programs, fixed point numbers are represented using a bit vector with an implicit point. Here we have an 8-bit bit vector with a point indicating the four fractional bits. Unlike floating point arithmetic, the point does not move, meaning the fractional part is fixed. We can interpret this as a rational number where the numerator is the bit vector shifted left up to the point as an integer and the denominator is the number of bits shifted to the power of two. All basic fixed point operations can be implemented using integer operations. However, since the point is fixed, additional considerations arise when considering the result of an operation. The result of an operation may land outside the valid fixed point range requiring a range reduction. Multiplication and division require extra care because they may produce results with unrepresentable fractional portions, necessitating rounding. Additionally, we must allow for unsigned and signed operations. We will now work a couple of examples to demonstrate these two issues and possible resolutions. We will first show an addition in unsigned 2.2 fixed point format. In this format, the valid fixed point numbers are in the range 0 to 3.75 in increments of 0 0.25 or a quarter. Consider the two numbers A and B. A is equal to 1.5 and B is equal to 2.75. The sum of A and B is 4.25 with the bit pattern 100.01. Notice the result is overflowed for this format as indicated by the highlighted high bit. Next, we will show two possible methods to handle this behavior. There are two commonly used methods for handling overflow behavior found in software implementations. Wraparound continues the range as if the real numbers were wrapped on the fixed point range. In this case, the resulting sum 4.25 is corrected to 0.25. Notice that this is the same behavior as two's complement arithmetic. Another choice is to use saturating arithmetic. Here, the resulting sum is brought back to the nearest representable number, in this case, 3.75. Next, we will show an example requiring rounding. Here we have A equal to 1.25 and B equal to 0 0.75. The product of A and B is 0 0.9375 with the bit pattern 00.11111. We notice that the result has an unrepresentable fractional portion as indicated by the two highlighted least significant bits. Next, we see two ways to correct this result. We have two choices for rounding the result to a representable number. We can round the result up to the next representable fixed point number. In this case, the result becomes 1.0. The result can also be rounded down. In this case, the result becomes 0.75. Notice that rounding down produces a result equivalent to truncation. In the semantics, we will discuss the precise behavior of overflow handling and rounding. But first, we will briefly walk through the syntax. Here, OM denotes an overflow mode sort, which can be either wraparound or saturation. RM is a rounding mode sort and can be either round up or round down. 
fb and tb are integers and denote the number of total bits and fractional bits respectively. The constructor allows us to create constants with tb total bits and fb fractional bits. Here the s and u in the function name and sort name denote whether a sort is signed or unsigned. We will omit the unsigned syntax for brevity. Here we have the syntax for addition and multiplication. Notice that only multiplication requires a rounding mode because addition is always precise in the fractional portion. Subtraction and division are defined similarly. We also provide for comparisons including greater than, less than, and equality comparisons. The conversion function to SFXP converts a real number to a signed fixed point number. Notice that both overflow and rounding modes are required as real numbers are not generally valid fixed point numbers. The SFXP to real conversion operator converts a fixed point number to a real number as a rational. Because fixed point numbers are real numbers, no correction is needed when performing this conversion. We leave conversions between other sorts, including between fixed point sorts undefined. We feel that the scope of these other conversions is too vague to supply a one-size-fits-all conversion and prefer to leave these conversions up to the user. Due to the similarity between fixed-point arithmetic and floating-point arithmetic, we felt it was most natural to base our syntax on that of the floating-point theory. We define a fixed-point sort in terms of its total bit width and the length of its fractional portion. This better matches fixed point programs, which for example use 32 bit integers as the underlying type and use 16 bits for the fractional portion. Unsigned and signed sorts are separated because even when they have compatible bit patterns, an operation between unsigned and signed sorts does not have a good interpretation. We instead allow users to define such operations themselves. We define all operations in terms of the interpretation of fixed point numbers as rational numbers. For example, we have the following bit pattern in 4.4 format. This number is 214 times 2 to the negative fourth, or 13.375 is an unsigned fixed point number, or negative 89 times 2 to the negative fourth, or negative 5.5625 as a signed fixed point number. The bit patterns of fixed point numbers are interpreted as twos complements numbers. We will now discuss the behavior of the wraparound overflow mode. We imagine the real number line as segmented into consecutive intervals, each representing an equivalence class. The canonical representatives are in the interval shown here. For the 2.2 format, the canonical unsigned range is from 0 to 3.75, and the canonical signed range is from negative 2 to 1.75. Fixed point numbers are wrapped around to the canonical representative. For example, negative 0 0.25 is wrapped around to 3.75. 4 is wrapped around to 0 and 4.25 is wrapped around 0.25. The saturation overflow mode corrects out of range results to the endpoints of the interval. If the result is less than the representable range, then the result is corrected to the smallest representable number. In this example, the result negative 0.25 is corrected to zero. If the result is greater than the representable range, then the result is corrected to the maximum number. In this example, 4.0 is corrected to 3.75. Likewise, 4.25 is also corrected to 3.75. Finally, we discussed the two rounding modes. The roundup mode corrects a result to the next greater fraction. The real numbers that are rounded up are in the half open interval between two adjacent fixed point numbers, as shown here. All numbers greater than 1.5 but less than or equal to 2 are rounded to 2. The round down mode works similarly with unrepresentable numbers being rounded to the next lower fraction. Here the interval is open at 2 but closed at 1.5. All numbers in this interval round to 
Notice that a number that is already a valid fixed point number is unchanged by rounding. Multiplication and division require both overflow handling and rounding. What is the interaction between the two modes and what effect does the order of applying these operations have? If we round the result first and then apply overflow handling second, we get a valid fixed point number. This is because rounding makes the fractional portion representable, then overflow correction makes the entire number representable. If we apply overflow handling first, then rounding second, we may end up with an unrepresentable number. This happens when the overflow corrected result is between the maximum representable number and the next fraction. If roundup rounding is applied, then the result will be out of range. This can be remedied by applying another round of overflow correction. Fortunately, both methods ultimately produce the same number, so we define the sequence of operations as applying rounding first, then overflow correction second. We chose to implement our work in the PYSMT tool. This allowed us to leverage an existing framework to adapt a parser and type checker for our new theory and convert our queries into theories supported by existing SMT solvers. In particular, we focus on quantifier-free fixed point queries and their translations into the quantifier-free bit vector and quantifier-free nonlinear integer arithmetic theories. We also developed a test suite through automatic translation of certain floating point benchmarks. This served as a way to test the correctness of the BV and real translations by checking equisatisfiability. This also produced a useful benchmarking suite to assess the efficiency of our translations and of SMT solvers. We compute using one extra bit in the case of saturating addition and subtraction. Extra precision is not needed for these operations for wraparound because that is the behavior of the underlying bit vector theory. Multiplication and division must be computed in a double bit width. This allows us to check all fractional bits as if the result were computed using real arithmetic and check for all overflowing results. Because wraparound is the effective overflow mode in two's complement, this almost comes for free from the theory. However, as mentioned previously, an inconvenient rounding operation may make the wrapped result incorrect. In the real encoding, we represent fixed point numbers as rational numbers, which are equivalent to a fraction with a denominator of two to the f. One benefit of computing over reals is that the operations we use are always exact. We need only check that the numerator of addition and subtraction is in range. While multiplication and division are straightforward to compute as rationals, these operations require an expensive conversion to an integer in order to properly round them. Free variables are constrained to be fractions with the correct denominator. If this is not the case, then erroneous satisfying models may be produced. We prepared a benchmark suite through automatic translation of the SMT comp floating point theory benchmarks. This gave us a ready source of benchmarks that we consider to be at least interesting and challenging, if not necessarily meaningful. All benchmarks were translated into queries using signed fixed point numbers with 32 total bits and 16 fractional bits. We chose this format because it is the most commonly used in software. We extended the benchmark suite by specifying each of the four rounding mode and overflow mode combinations. Specifically, round up with wraparound, round up with saturation, round down with wraparound, and round down with saturation. In total, we generated 872 benchmarks with 218 for each rounding mode and overflow combination. For testing our translations, we translated these benchmarks into queries in the quantifier-free bit vector and quantifier-free nonlinear integer real arithmetic theories. We benchmarked our queries using the Boole Lector, CVC4, MathSat, YICs, and Z3SMT solvers.
This table summarizes the results of our benchmarking efforts. The bit vector and real encoding columns indicate the results as if the solvers for these theories were treated as a portfolio solver. The all column summarizes the results as if all solvers were treated as a portfolio solver. We can see overall that the bit vector encoding is much better for finding SAT instances. For unsat queries, the two encodings are more competitive. From the all column, we see that only 65 out of 872 benchmarks were unsolvable given our benchmark time limits. Here we see the number of benchmarks solved by one theory and not the other. Interestingly, the real encoding solved four benchmarks uniquely, three of which were unsat. It can be seen that the bit vector encoding is more efficient overall. However, the real encoding gives some results we may otherwise have missed. This is a quantile plot comparing a portfolio of BV encoding solvers in orange to a portfolio of real encoding solvers in blue. The x-axis represents the number of benchmarks solved and the y-axis represents the minimum time for each solver to solve that many benchmarks. Notice that the y-axis is on a logarithmic scale. Quantile plots allow us to compare the overall performance of solvers. We see that for the first 145 benchmarks solved, the bit vector encoding is superior. However, for, for benchmarks which take more than about one-tenth of a second to complete, the real encoding is superior. Both encodings ultimately solved 187 benchmarks, but the real encoding was solved in about a quarter of the time. This is because real solvers have an easier time with the saturation overflow mode, and round down is closest in behavior to the real to integer operation needed for rounding. We highlight this category because it demonstrates a case where the real encoding may be superior and gives hints for further optimization. In summary, we have seen that overall, the bit vector encoding is superior. Wraparound overflow handling is harder for the real encoding solvers compared to saturation. We observed uniquely solved instances for both encodings, suggesting there is value in both approaches. We saw that the real encoding solvers can be competitive or even superior to bit vector encoding solvers in some circumstances. We found that overall, the ICS2 solver was the dominant solver for both encodings. We applied our tool to an existing project exploring symbolic fixed point quantization of neural networks. In our first example, we explore a safety property of a pole balancing robot. At right, such a robot is shown. The goal is to have the robot move left or right in order to keep the attached pole vertical. We explored symbolically training a neural network controller for such a robot. Our first finding is that the training algorithm has a preference for using the pole's angle to determine the motion of the robot. Here we see that for negative angles, the robot decides to move left. Interestingly, we found that there are possible neural networks where the controller will decide to go left and right at the same time. Some of these areas are highlighted in the table. This happens despite the clear symmetry of the problem. We also explored inherent bias in trained quantized neural networks. In this example, a quantized neural network is trained to predict grades. The input variables include personal details, including gender. We explored the effect of the bias of the underlying data set against female students. We trained two symbolic networks to compare the maximum difference between their predictions. We found that the maximum bias is 11.5% against female students, but there is no other person who would have a bias of more than 11.5% regardless of gender. This allows us to quantify the amount of bias that may be learned by a neural network. As mentioned in the implementation of the real encoding, variables are constrained to have the correct denominator. If this constraint is dropped, the solver may be able to show a query is unsat faster. An unsat result in this case is unsat for the fully constrained theory. However, satisfying models need to be checked for validity against these constraints. We can use stochastic local search techniques to quickly find satisfying instances. 
Similar techniques have been demonstrated to be effective for solving floating point queries. It may be useful to explore a constrained version of the floating point theory given some of the similarities between the theories. In summary, we developed and defined a syntax and semantics for an SMT theory of fixed point arithmetic. We implemented a prototype tool using the PYSMT framework to explore some different approaches for solving queries written in this theory. We created a benchmark suite to assess the performance of solver techniques and test for correctness. We verified our results against a separate project exploring symbolic, quantized neural networks. Thank you for listening to my talk. All right, are there questions? Nobody there to answer, uh, ask a question in the chat, so let me start. Uh, is Marek uh, there? Yes. Okay, so, so, so one thing I, I, I'm interested in is like in this, um, uh, like f work on uh, by Martin Train and others on, on encoding floating points right into bit vectors. They were using, of course, the IEEE standard. Isn't there a standard for fixed point two or? Yes, there is a standard. And, and how do you, uh, how is your approach relating to that one? Are you, you sure you, you matching that, that um, standard or? Um, we tried to match the standard as best as possible. But because you're the first, you're not having any comparison, right? Or is there like a way of, uh, of really, maybe, maybe there's hardware or something else where you can compare it? Um, um, as best as we know, um, we match the standard. Um, we also tried to match um, software implementations. All right. Uh, the, then maybe along the same line. So you actually mentioned this in your your or your conclusions too. So there's this, um, of course, this floating point theory and. Uh, well, what's the kind of, if you compare the two, I mean, probably your fixed point is much smaller, right? Uh, in, in terms of sort of um, complexity of uh, when you encode things. Uh, uh, did you make any any observation in this direction? Like if you, you, you took some floating point benchmarks, right? And then you could use the floating point encoding and then maybe all, also your truncated fixed point encoding and see how big the SAT formulas that is the, the the, the sort of ECNF formulas would get or something. Did you do something in this direction? Uh, no, we didn't. Okay, but, but your take on, on this is that it's w way more uh, complex the floating point or not? Like uh, I think floating point is more complex, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, other questions? Like I have one last one. Uh, so I was unmuted so I could ask a question. Oh. So I, I will ask my question. Um, I presume in converting these benchmarks for, or taking the, fi the floating point benchmarks and converting them into the fixed point ones, they, they do not preserve the satisfiability of the, um, the original floating point instance, right? Uh, so when you're giving your SAT and your unsat, that must be the answer that comes from... Um, the SMT solver rather than what was labeled in the benchmark. What kind of places do does the satisfiability change? And did you notice that it was very, very common that the satisfiability changed or were they mostly uh, the same and things like that? Um, yes, so um, we noticed that uh, satisfiability changed quite often from the floating point benchmarks because um, these are very different uh, computations we were performing. So did, did you, were you happy that they were, did you ever have any instances where, like, did you check those to make sure that it was correct that you were giving a different satisfiability answer? Or did you just trust that your implementation was correct? I'm not saying your implementation is incorrect. I'm just asking the interesting question. Um, so we have two independent uh, implementations that we checked against and we confirmed Via third, via third uh, implementation, that satisfiable instances were indeed satisfiable. Okay, thank you.
Okay, here's. Okay, and I would have um, your motivation or your applications are like uh, in the context of verifying neural networks. But, but like when I, when I saw the title of the paper, I first thought, okay, so you're going to verify sort of some, some hardware, some, some float like, I don't know, like uh, signal processing hardware or something. Um, so, so are you only interested in this, this uh, neural network verification or something else? Um, not necessarily. Um, we have found other um, programs that... Uh, use fixed point arithmetic in their computations. Um, but we have not gotten around to actually checking safety properties or anything like that yet. All right, and then, then one thing, the more questions, like a follow up on your bullet uh, I mentioned already before. Um, so, so can you, in principle, encode your um, these fixed points into the floating points here, or is it like kind of is there, are there some issues where sort of there is no clean translation? I mean, of course, you could uh, probably do it, uh, but sort of like is there a nice uh, sort of like uh, almost structural translation? Um, yeah. So if you constrain the floating point theory to have a con a uh, fixed um, exponent range, then yes, it would be um, equivalent to our fixed point theory. But in practice, you didn't do this, right? So you could, uh, uh, you could kind of, instead of encoding into bit vectors, you could use FP and then use an FT solver or... Yeah, we did not do that. Okay. And do you see, see like lots of problems in doing that or is it more uh, like you haven't tried? Um, we haven't tried it and it didn't seem promising. It. Okay, I see. Yeah. All right, so like since there are no more questions. And... I, I will make a comment. Um, yes. At SAT in a few weeks, whenever it is, there's this paper on um, speeding up quantify a bit vector instances by doing uh, bit width reductions. I wonder if there's an interesting um, further avenue for to look at is to take large fixed width bit problems, reduce them down into smaller ones, see what the performance looks like, and if you can preserve equisatisfiability. Yeah, so, so you probably mean the work by Martin Jonas and Jan. yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. In the thesis of Martin Jonas, there is actually exactly what you asked before, like, uh, but for bit vectors, like, uh, not for uh, fixed bit vectors, like trying to uh, reduce the bit width of this. Yeah. yeah. So that that's the paper I was referring to. I was just wondering oh. if there if there are, if there are instances where fixed point numbers can be reduced in a similar kind of way, like you can reduce the number of bits for the top and the bottom part, preserve equisatisfiability and see what the performance looks like. It was, yeah, more of like an observation, interesting thing that this work seemed to tie quite well into what was coming up at SAP. Yep. All right, more, more questions, comments. Otherwise, let's thank the speaker again. All right.